Jorge asked me to talk just briefly about the concept of poverty as it is currently used and measured. And I will start you off with a short movie by two famous people. I love the Better Angels of Our Nature. I'm maybe more thrilled about your next book, Enlightenment Now. I, I was inspired to write it after I finished uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, which had all of these graphs showing measures of violence and decline. And people started to write to me from disciplines that I was only dimly aware of, saying it's actually much better than you even <laughs> mentioned. Hunger is declining. And Okay, that's all I wanted to show you. <laughs> so what Bill Gates and Steve Pinker are saying is that basically severe poverty, hunger has disappeared. It doesn't exist anymore. There was 18, 20% of it in 1991, but now we are basically down to zero. Now let's look at the real numbers. These are the official numbers that you get from various UN agencies. We are 7.8 billion people now. We have about 822 million people chronically undernourished officially. More than 2 billion with lack of access to essential medicines. 844 million lack of drinking water. Over a billion lack adequate shelter a billion lack electricity, 2.6 billion lack adequate sanitation, 750 million adults are illiterate, and 152 million children do wage work outside their household. So despite what Bill Gates and Steve Pinker want you to believe, poverty is very much with us. Uh, the two most important poverty statistics that you find always in the media are household income statistics, which are kept by the World Bank, and undernourishment statistics, which are kept by a consortium. They have an annual state of food insecurity report that is published jointly by the FAO, the IFAD, the UNICEF, uh, the World Food Program and the World Health Organization. I will comment a little bit on these official statistics because they are frankly garbage and everybody should know that. So here are the diagrams from the World Bank. This is from their own website. And what you can see here is a dramatic reduction in poverty. Poverty went from about 1.25 billion people in 2008 to 750 million people in uh, 2015. That's a 40% reduction in just seven years. So great success. If you look at the hunger statistics, you do not find anything similar. You find essentially no progress or very little progress in the very same period that the World Bank reports great 40% reduction. So essentially the number of hungry people is just about the same in 2008 and 2015. It's a little lower, but certainly not anywhere near 40%. So you already ask yourself what gives, right? They, they, they should be more or less parallel. Uh, the answer is both of these statistics are real garbage and not worth the paper they're printed on. Let me say something first about the World Bank's poverty statistics. I give you six criticisms that I think together are quite powerful. The first one is that the progress we make against poverty depends very much on how high or low you set the poverty line. We are counting people below a poverty line. And if you set the poverty line really low, the progress looks much better than if you set the poverty line higher. This is just an empirical fact that they put the poverty line at a place where it reduces rather quickly. And with hindsight, you can always do that. Secondly, the way in which they measure it, you have to compare, right? You have to price out everything in terms of the poverty line. 
which is $1.90 per person per day in 2011 US dollars. That is the definition of the poverty line. And to decide whether a particular household is poor or not, you have to translate the line into other countries and into other years. So it's a complicated process that requires using consumer price indices, as you can see here, CPIs, and also purchasing power parities, which translate from one country's currency into another country's currency. They don't use foreign exchange rates, they use purchasing power parities. Now, this process is really working with apples and oranges because the consumer price index in India is measuring the price level against a commodity basket in India, whereas the second transition uses a commodity basket for the whole world. Both of these commodity baskets are quite different from what poor people consume. So both of them are really quite irrelevant. You could, if you wanted to, go the other way, as I've shown here in purple, and you would get very different results, often 30%, 50% different results. There's no reason to go one way rather than the other, but depending on which way you go, you get dramatic differences. Now, the third uh, problem is the distortion through general consumption CPIs and PPPs. So when they ask themselves, how much is an Indian rupee of the year 1996 compared to an American dollar in 2011, they will ask that in terms of the consumption of people in general, all the things that the world consumes, airplane tickets, computers, land, haircuts, everything is put in there and put in there in proportion to how much it is consumed. Now, poor people consume only a very small part of that. They spend 80% of their money on food. And so most of the prices are completely irrelevant to them. Television sets are much cheaper now than they used to be. And so are other electronics. It doesn't matter for the poor, right? What matters for the poor is what does rice cost? And you can see here, the price differences are dramatic, dramatic. You know, some things have gone up 200%, other things have gone down 95%. And so it matters which prices we use to compare the incomes of the poor to. In the case of PPPs, let's just go through the US and India for a moment. In the case of PPPs, right, the 2011 is the base year of the World Bank. At that time, the US dollar was trading at 49 Indian rupees. Now the World Bank is saying, ah, but really you need only 15 rupees to have as much purchasing power as a US dollar in 2011. Now that's true for all the goods and services consumed, but it's not true for food. So the same World Bank is saying on the same page that in fact, in order to buy as much food and non-alcoholic beverages, you need 21 rupees to match the buying power of a dollar. But still, when deciding whether an Indian household is poor or not, they use 15 Indian rupees as the cutoff. And that's true across the board. Food is a tradable good. It can easily be transported across national borders. And so while it is cheaper in India than in rich countries, it is not much cheaper. The things that are much, much, much cheaper in India and other poor countries are things that cannot cross international borders, like for example, uh, services, haircuts, they are 50 times cheaper, babysitters, chauffeurs, and so on. But of course, poor people do not consume services. Poor people are services 
on their lucky days. So notice here also how very, very low the poverty line of the World Bank is. They say that you are not poor if you have a dollar ninety, the purchasing power of a dollar ninety per person per day, but that's really worth only a dollar twenty six in terms of food. Another problem is that by having a poverty line, you are prioritizing the people who are just below the line. A government that wants to reduce poverty will focus on those people, will try to get them above the line. Those are the easiest people to make non-poor. The people who are very poor will tend to be ignored and the people who are just above the poverty line will also be ignored because by improving their condition you are not reducing poverty. There's also a disregard by the World Bank of what happens within the household. The World Bank is simply dividing the household income by the, in, by the number of people in the household and is ignoring how the household income is distributed. Whether, for example, the girls and women get as much food as the boys and the men, which is often not the case. And finally, the World Bank is also ignoring other dimensions of poverty, most importantly time, right? It makes a big difference how long you have to work in order to get your dollar and 90 or how much ever it is. And if you have to work 160 hours a week to achieve that, then of course, this is a very dire situation compared to one where you work only 70 hours or 40 hours. Now let's go to the FAO and their measurement of undernourishment. Uh, I've cited this here, this comes directly from the uh, 2012 SOFI where they explain their methodology. And you can read it here, the FAO method has been based on the measurement of dietary energy intake. So undernourishment has been defined as an extreme form of food insecurity arising when food energy availability is inadequate to cover even minimum needs for a sedentary lifestyle. So here are the four elements of their definition. The first element is we're looking at the food that a person ingests. This is a mistake because many poor people have absorption problems. They have, for example, parasites or worms. And so the food that they ingest that goes into their mouth is not all processed for the benefit of the human being, but some of it is basically eaten by parasites within the body. The World Bank is ignoring that problem that affects as many as 25% of poor people. Secondly, the World Bank is focusing only on energy. That means calories. Everything else is ignored. The World, uh, these uh, FAO, I should say, the FAO is essentially saying that if you live from just Coca-Cola, just Coca-Cola with a lot of sugar, of course, that's good enough for you to avoid being undernourished. But everybody knows that you need vitamins, that you need proteins, that you need minerals in order to be well nourished. And that again is ignored by this methodology. The third point is that they say you need only as much energy as is necessary for a sedentary lifestyle. Now that again is a big mistake because many people among the poor do not have a sedentary lifestyle. Uh, women run down to the river to fetch water and have to carry it up the river bank to their houses. People ride rickshaws, people work in construction and so on. They don't do that as a hobby, they do it because that is what their income depends on. And so you can't say that they're well nourished if they have enough income to meet the minimum needs for a sedentary lifestyle, which is 1800 
kilocalories for a grown man. And then they say, we count you as undernourished only if you are below that level for over a year. And I want to show you how they argue for that. Here it is. The reference period should be long enough for the consequences of low food intake to be detrimental to health. Although there is no doubt that temporary food shortage may be stressful, the FAO indicator is based on a full year. So again, this is grotesque. Everybody knows, you all know, that a human being cannot survive, let alone be healthy, if we don't get food for a whole year. We die within 40 days and without water even much sooner. So again, it's completely ridiculous not to count people who suffer undernourishment for periods less than a year. These are the ways in which the statistics are produced. So what we should conclude from that is that these statistics are not worth taking seriously and we should use our influence, if we have any, to try to duplicate these statistics, to have academics work on this, and at least in one country or one province, to work out how many people really are undernourished, how many people really live in poverty, rather than rely on these statistics, which of course are heavily influenced by the propaganda needs of governments. Governments want to show progress. But there's also a deeper question here. And that deeper question is, should we, when we think about poverty, should we really look at progress as our big criterion? Should we be comparing the present poverty with the poverty in the past and most likely conclude, look, it was even worse in the past. So let's be grateful for the progress that we've made. The Goals language of the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals suggests that that is what we should do. But I think we should go back to the human rights language, which suggests a very different baseline for comparison. We are to compare today's poverty, not to yesterday's poverty, but to the poverty that today is unavoidable. If there is a human right, not to be poor, then anybody who is poor and whose poverty is avoidable now has their human rights violated, regardless of how much better or worse the situation may have been 10, 15, 20, 40 years ago. And such a human right is, of course, included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also in the Second Covenant. Everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services. Let me conclude with just one remark about why poverty persists at such massive dramatic numbers, which are not recognized, not acknowledged by our governments. One big explanatory factor is that we live under supranational, regional, and national institutional arrangements, rules, practices, procedures that were designed by the rich for the rich. The rich have a very dominant role in designing these institutions. And of course, they design them for their own benefit insofar as they can. These arrangements strengthen them economically and politically. These arrangements undermine democracy and these arrangements also perpetuate the marginalization and empowerment of the world's poor. All this gets aggravated by environmental degradation which benefits the rich and harms the poor much more and violence, which is also concentrated in poor areas of the world, wars, civil wars, and the violence of repression, domestic violence, and so on. So I'll 
conclude here. Thank you very much, Thomas. I'm going to stop now recording. Uh, so we